Tennis fans from around the world, welcome to another edition of Luke's Legends. And we have an extraordinary legend, Mary <laughs> Carrillo, as high as number 33 in the world. This beautiful left-hander ended up dominating the landscape. This extraordinary <laughs> talent won the 1977 mixed doubles at the French Championships in her rookie season on the WTA Tour. Mary, welcome to the show. What, what did I dominate, Luke? I, why don't I remember that, that part of my career? You carried another lefty <laughs> from Douglaston That's to true. that title, to his very first Grand Slam title. You gave him the Kavorka. You gave him the power. John I, McEnroe. Was, should, should we also mention that it was my last Grand Slam title? My only <laughs> Grand Slam title? Hey, hey you, you got one. You, so did you. It's same yep, place. Same good, place. Old, good old French Open, man, with your brother. Un unbelievable. So, so Mary... Tell Can me you about, tell that. Tell me that quick. Tell these people this that quick story about how it was in fact my mixed doubles player John McEnroe who gave you and your brother a huge pep talk before that match, the final at the French. There's I a love lot, this story. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'll even go to 1994, where my very first show on ESPN, you mentored me. You and I called a Boris Becker match in True. Paris for Bercy. So there's a lot of Paris connections. Um, <laughs> But that so in '93 we are playing two Germans, Goldner and Prinisel. They'd beaten a bunch of seeds, and we'd kind of snuck through the draw. And so we're playing, and the, you know these Grand Slam finals are amazing because in the locker room it's empty. Right. You know the very first day you've got 128 singles players and their coaches and their bags and doubles players and stuff, and then it just thins out. And for the first time you're sitting there, and it's just you and your opponents, and your opponents are. 10, 15 feet away. It was the yep. 49th anniversary of the Normandy invasion of D-Day. And we're playing two Germans and Murphy and I are just sitting there and, <laughs> and we're just waiting for the women's singles match to finish. And at that point, John wasn't calling the women's final. And so he comes storming through and he stops me. And I was on the Davis Cup team as a, like an orange squeezer, it's a towel boy uh, for 91 and 92 when we won. And right. so I knew him really well and going back with Patrick and we played doubles together. So he knew me. He didn't know Murphy. So he kind of stops and he kind of looks at us. He goes, I want you to take those Germans to the beaches and send them back. And, he, and he's given this whole general patent speech. And the Germans who speak great English are right there. And I'm like looking over and it was just like, holy crap. And Murphy <laughs> like, John McEnroe's giving us this Vince Lombardi, you know, just fire firestorm speech and uh it was just surreal absolutely <laughs> surreal and then you know just you know you win one you know you get one i always feel if you if you lose that final I'll never my entire life i knew i may never get there again yeah so like that's a huge victory did you feel that way when you won yours no, I was 20 years old John was 18 he was playing in the French Open juniors which is why he was there the USTA had given John McEnroe and a couple of other of the, the young players $500, Luke, to at, for, and with that 500, 500 clams was supposed to get them to the French Open junior event and the Wimbledon junior event. That was supposed to last the whole time. John skipped his high school graduation, yeah. wins the French Open juniors, and we win the mix. And then, of course, instead of playing the junior event at Wimbledon a few weeks later, he plays the qualifying of the main event, gets through that, and gets himself to the semis. So his whole <laughs> life changed. It, 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 was, it was a great summer because uh, I was traveling around with this kid. We'd, we'd grown up together yeah. a couple of blocks away, and one of us was getting very famous. Not, not me. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I want to backtrack a little bit because the eastern section of the USTA at that time was producing elite talent. Uh, I mean, seriously. You, McEnroe, Fleming, Vetus came out of there. Patrick, no. you know, came out of that system. Uh, you have Harry Hopman was at the Port Washington at the time. Of course, you had the U.S. Open at the West Side Tennis Club. A lot of stuff was going on. Yes. What was really the magic formula that the USTA and the U.S. seems to have lost that produces that kind of talent? I don't know. I, I think the Port Washington Tennis Academy was extraordinary. I mean, it was a great place. The guy who ran it, uh, the late, great Heisauser, put a lot of kids on scholarship. It was a nonprofit organization. I grew, I had grown up thinking that the best tennis players either came from Florida, you know, the clay courts of Florida or the hard courts of California. And at the time, Texas was a big deal. 
So I sort of grew up thinking, God, I wish I was someplace warmer, you mm -hmm. know? But then the Port Washington Tennis Academy happened to me and to so many other people. And the Easter Bowl was held there for many years, a big junior event. It became this hotbed, the Tony Palapox, who I talked to just last week. He's, he's still teaching. The guy's 78 years old. He's teaching in Atlanta. You probably know that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's still, we, we just, it was a great collection of humanity. Terrific coaches. We had a lot of time to practice. There were hard courts, there were clay courts. So I think Port, uh, it be, just became, uh, I mean, I, I genuinely spent just about every day for about five years at that place. And that's it was amazing. just, it was wonderful. Yeah, so I think I'm, I'm giving a lot of credit to, to the Port Washington Tennis Academy. And mm -hmm. then of course, once that happens, other places spring up and mm -hmm. other terrific coaches want to come around. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're playing in your pro career, you blow out your knee, right? So the yeah. knee goes and then the career goes. So tell me, how does broadcasting get in there? What, what happens to Mary Carrillo post playing on the WTA tour? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, Luke, a, a lot of us from Port ended up getting behind a microphone. Vetus and John and Patrick and me. I Fleming think as too. We, hey, Peter Fleming. Peter Fleming yeah. does a, a lot of work exactly uh, in England. Um, I think New Yorkers and Fleming's from New Jersey. I think we just feel like we have a lot to say. We're very opinionated <laughs> and we're willing to share. Um, but yeah, I was lucky. Uh, as as a player, I, I I was already writing articles while I was still on the mm. WTA tour for uh, newspapers and magazines and doing. So, I mean, I liked that whole the media end of it. I thought it was really interesting. I remember going to Forest Hills when I was a little kid and just wandering all around the grounds of those you know that the West Side Tennis Club. And then I'd pick up the paper, the Long Island Press or the the Daily News, or the New York Post the next day, and they'd have covered like some match. I mean, that was a terrible match. You know, that match lasted 40 minutes. Why weren't you out on court 13? That was where the best match, that the match of the day, you didn't even talk. Like, <laughs> and when, even when I played, I would go into the, the media centers after I finished and just watch and see how these people put their stories together. I mean, I come from a, a family of storytellers. My father's an artist. My brother's a writer. My son is an actor. My sister did a bunch of it. We all seem to, Feel like we we yeah. can contribute to the narrative but it's hard though because at the time it was and i'm looking at these you know the vintage matches you know jack kramer's calling matches and you've got yeah, yeah. mainly male dominant and then i start to see virginia wade start to do yeah. a little bit you start to jump in i remember i think you did chris everett's last match at the u.s open and at cbs and it was like you could, I mean, it's amazing to watch even your growth as a broadcaster where you're kind of earning your chops and, and finding a way to really, you know, give content. And it was just well, wonderful. Well, you know what? What's also interesting about that, Luke, is that uh, <laughs> I wasn't that good a player. Um, so, I mean, most time, most of the time, especially uh, in recent decades, you you've got to be a star to get a gig. You know, I wasn't, but I was hungry and I was working for cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I did a lot of little events. And at the point when I got to call men's tennis as well as women's tennis, mm -hmm. that became a game changer because there was a lot more men's tennis on TV mm -hmm. than women. So the fact that I'm a woman and the fact that I wasn't a champion, mm -hmm. I think that part of it is even a little bit more surprising um, than anything else. And then I, from there, I ended up covering other sports and getting involved in documentaries and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So it grew from there. But I mean, I've, I've, I've gotten letters from Syracuse, from your place and, and not lately because no one writes letters anymore, but I used to get letters from students, you know, at Columbia or Syracuse or, you know, dear Ms. Carrillo, uh, I'm so-and-so and I'm a senior and I'm, I'm, I'm a communications major and an English minor, and I work at the radio station every weekend, and I love sports, but I really like tennis more than anything, and I, I want your job. I mean, that was basically, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what should I do that I haven't done? And yeah. so, you know, invariably, I'd call them, all right, first, all right, first win Wimbledon. Okay, then, you know, <laughs> like there's always that pause on the other, I said, I'm just kidding, but if you could win Wimbledon, it would really, it would help your chance. <laughs> So I don't uh, think I was any help to anyone, frankly. Yeah. But, 
but no, that's the, I think that has been, uh, I've been lucky in that I, uh, you know, if you hang around long enough uh, and you show that you're willing to, you know, throw some elbow grease into the work, uh, you end up getting more assignments. And that's kind of what happened to me. But the thing is, you really enjoy it. You come in and you're a delight, honestly, to, to the meetings and you add so much more than just, hey, I'm a former champion. Tell me when you want me to start talking. I mean, you know what's going on on the practice courts. You know, who's dating who? Who just dumped <laughs> this coach, that coach? You really bring such interesting angles to it. And I mean, again, listening to all those old matches that you're coming up, yes, the Tony Traberts are, you know, uh, nukes, they're given their certain perspective. And then you come in and say, yeah, well, so-and-so, you know, they, they just tweaked their ankle two days ago on the practice right. court on court seven. You know, talk about that angle, like really the hustle part of yes. the job. I think that I, the, the people I most admire in sports casting, not just tennis, they, they bring a lot of energy and a lot of interest and they want to make sure that they've got things covered. And Luke, you know, we've worked together. Um, you think you've prepared well for a match and you've read all the, you know, there's so much good research now. So a lot, and I can go on Twitter. I, can, I follow 25 different newspapers from around the world to get all my information. It used to be a lot harder than it is now. Now it's, it's, it's hard to keep up with it all, but you prepare and you think, all right, this is going to be the storyline. And then, and, and you think you've got it all set. And then you only end up using like 10% of your, yeah, yeah of your material because it's not the match that you thought it was going to be. You thought the match was going to be very physical and it's not. You thought the match was going to depend on one player holding serve and that's not. So, and then you have, and if it's a terrible match, then, you know, you really have to, you have to clean it up a little, like you have to, all right, I got to work a lot harder. If it's a great match, you talk a lot less as you, and you know, we both had those great matches. All you got to do is hope a director is cutting cameras well. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. but a bad match, man. You start really going through your notes. You know, <laughs> oh man, what what is of interest to this? You know, it's unbelievable. And and, and funnily enough, I got to work for many years with Cliff Drysdale mm -hmm. and Fred Solly. Solly. And oh. I mean, and Fred, good old Fiery, who I I have long adored. There were we were calling one match that was really lame. I mean, it was, and I'm just pulling stuff out yeah. of the files. You know, just trying to keep some interest and and fred we go into a commercial and fred said mez i like your effort but just remember you can't shine <laughs> classic <laughs> fred. it's so classic fred right yeah and, I, and that's true i'd been trying to shine that thing for like <laughs> for a long over an hour you know oh, um, well so anyway, that was also a good lesson like don't and something's going on when it's not going on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, <laughs> and how, I mean, you've been at so many different stages of this game. And I, I really want you to comment on a, on a couple of things. Roger Federer said something about a week or so ago that it's time for both tours right. to really pivot, to really be a true union. And, and right. Billy Jean King has always said that always. in the seventies that Arthur and Cliff Drysdale and Stan Smith, they had an opportunity, but they didn't want the women at the time. And you know, it's a different time right. now. And right. we have maybe the perfect time with the perfect person and Roger Federer that draws enough water from both sides and all in all sides and, and can really get it going. What are your thoughts on that comment? Well, I mean, I, I actually found Roger's comment disingenuous, you know, cause he mm. wrote it, the Twitter, com he wrote, Am I the only one who thinks that it might be a good idea? Remember how he phrased it? He framed yep. it in like this sort of, you know, rhetorical. Like, uh, and I'm thinking, wait, and I love Raj, but yeah. buddy, you're not the only one. Billie Jean King, my idol, yeah. Yeah. there she is. The blue I mean, shoes, yes. I got my, I mean, Billy had, Billy assumed when tennis went pro that the men and women were going to be together. I mean, that was mm -hmm. like, why wouldn't that happen? Why wouldn't it? Yeah. And, and to your point, the guys didn't, they didn't think they needed the women. They didn't want the women. They didn't want to be sharing the pot. You know, Billy has wanted this for five decades. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the fact that, look, I'm glad that uh, as powerful a presence as Roger Federer has made people think that this might be doable. I'm not sure it is, by the way, I'd love mm -hmm. to think it is, but there's just so much stuff to, yeah. to make that happen. And I'm not sure it can happen in the mm -hmm. ways that would satisfy someone like me who believes in 
equality across the board, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. equal prize money, equal show courts, uh, equal TV rights, equal, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, for that to happen would take an incredible amount of, uh, of work on every side. Um, and but so yeah, it was, yeah. it was, it's, you're right. This is, yeah. we're in a global pandemic. I mean, if you can't sit around and, and, and yeah. talk through zoom or whatever now, yeah, everything's quiet. I mean, when on earth could you ever pull that together and get the sponsors together and the media rights people together and yeah. the ATP and the WTA and the ITF and the, and the four majors. But then the question is, all right, you get them all at a, yeah, you get them all together, but the four majors operate independently of each yeah. other. So do they get four votes or do mm. they get one collective vote? Like three out of five sets. Well, is that going to hang around? Women yeah. for coaching, is that going to hang around? If you want, if you want Wimbledon center court, as you know, the show courts, two men's matches mm -hmm. and one women's match a day because the men play three out of five. So, mm -hmm. so do you get rid of three out of five so there could be two men's matches and two women's matches? Look, mm -hmm. look how con like, yeah. there's a lot to, to even think about before yeah. everyone comes together. So yes, would I love it? Of course I'd love it. I love yeah. team events. I love mixed events. They're the most successful tennis events in the calendar year. What mm -hmm. there are probably what ten, including the majors, there are maybe ten tournaments all year long that have a real profit margin, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the yeah. rest are kind of you know teetering. Yeah, I, yeah, it's very very close. So if you can have more mixed of combined events mm -hmm. with equality, you know, if you could have more team events, mm -hmm. if if doubles and mixed doubles. I, I, I used to love the Hotman Cup. I love oh, yeah. the way the year oh, started. Serena playing a Federer <laughs> a couple of years ago. Like I stayed up at four o'clock in the morning. I'm watching that match. How it was just was wonderful. Oh, I mean, great. I, I mean, I love the idea that if we have to make all kinds of concessions because of social distancing and everything else, if we can have special smaller events like that, mm -hmm. that are obviously safe and very telegenic. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, that is my hope. Mm -hmm. That is my hope. We'll talk about world team tennis. We're presented by world team tennis and world team tennis has been around now 45 years. You know, there's no doubt, you know, all the players. Did you play world team tennis? My friend, who do you think was a New York apple? No way with here. Venus. You play with Venus. Okay. So first of all, I had, I, I didn't get to play much at all because I needed knee surgery that year, but I was on a team, Luke. You tell me if there has ever been someone luckier than me to be on the New York apples were captain Fred Stolle. Yep. Billie Jean King. Oh. And Joanne Russell. Yep. And Vetus Gerolitis. In Madison and, Square Garden. And this MOOC. And this MOOC. <laughs> Madison Square Garden. <laughs> Madison Square Garden and Felt Forum. I mean, as I said, I only lasted a couple of weeks because I, I needed to get cut again. I was already riding on rims by that point. But to be a part of that oh. squad, I mean, that's a solid ball club. There are a lot of laughs, a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Fred was a terrific captain. Billie Jean was herself. Yeah. I mean, I'll, t I'll tell you a, a, a Vita story that I know you'll like because we both remember him so fondly. Like the first road trip we took, I was at the, I was getting to the airport. It was kind of an early morning trip, and I got a pair of jeans on and a t. You know, I look, you know me. I, this is how, you know, I, I, I'm pretty casual by nature. And Vita shows up, and he's got this amazing suit on, yeah. like a three piece, and he looks, you know, and he shows up with his bag, and and I, I say to Fred Stolle, oh wait a minute, is there like a dress code for World Team Tennis? Like, am I supposed to, like, am I supposed to dress when I travel? Yeah. And Fiery looked at me and said, Mez, he never went to bed last night. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot in a very um, short amount of time. I, I learned uh, a lot. <laughs> this beat yeah. is so much. And so yeah. let's fast forward now. The real big one on the on the docket now is the US Open. What are your you thoughts? What you is it gonna happen? happen? Where is it gonna happen? You think it's gonna I don't think it's gonna happen. I I genuinely don't. That's my guess. What's your guess? I think they will. I think they the Where? TV I, I think they play it in New York. I think by the time they really have to get down to a decision, the numbers have will have come down in New York. All the infrastructure's right there. It won't be the same, obviously, no fans in the stands. They have got to solve the locker room situation. How do you put 128 singles players unless you, you know, make the draw smaller, let no doubles, 
That's I think that's the tricky one for the players. How how about flying to New York? Yeah. and quarantining for a couple of weeks, and then uh, there's a lot. I, once the players are there, that's not my big concern, and I'm sort of getting reluctantly used to the idea of fanless sports. But how do you get players from all around the world? Yeah, into into a hot spot city like New York. Yeah, I mean, how I'm do you hoping. and how can you guarantee yeah. you keep them safe? I yeah. just I. I think it's, I, as I said, I know that they're throwing around ideas about India Wells, mm -hmm. uh, Orlando, because that's a USTA owned mm -hmm. property, obviously, uh, but it's not set up for TV. Mm -hmm. I know how much ESPN, uh, I know the USJ is listening hard to ESPN who really mm -hmm. wants it to happen. And I get all of it, but mm -hmm. I just, I don't know, man. I, yeah. I, that we don't have a vaccine. Look, we don't have a vaccine. I live in Florida, okay? This place, our governor just, People are basically you do you do what you feel like if you don't mm. want to wear a man like it's so like crazy. I yeah. stay in this house except for seeing my granddaughter. Yeah. All I do is stay in this house and try to try to stay safe. Yeah, yeah. The, I, yeah. the idea of the idea of holding this thing without being able to I don't know. I hope you're right. I'd love yeah. to be wrong about this, uh, but I just don't see how anybody can be guaranteed. Uh, the Safety. players and the, the, I mean, so what? So you don't have the food court, right? Because that would be too yep. many people around. You have limited bathrooms, but then that becomes a problem. You have limited fans, but then are you really taking their temperature? And and mm -hmm. so what? You could be traveling with it for a couple of weeks before you even know you've got the, I mean, yeah. it, it's, that's yeah. going to be, that's going to, I I want to cover the US Open. Yeah. Um, I really want, would love to be there. And I'm a chick from Queens. That's yeah. where I, this is my, but right now, if you said, or next week, if you said to me, all right, you got to go. I don't know yeah. that I'd go. That's, amazing. That's how I feel yeah. right now. Yeah. And I, I, as you can tell, I mean, I've got a real, a real joy for this game. <laughs> for this game of my course. Job. That's I've great. Got, I've got things to say. <laughs> so, okay. Well, we're going to finish up. Thank you so much for your time. Where does the game come out of this? Like when, when we do get back to a new normal or the way it used to be, where do you think the game will go? We're going to lose Roger soon and Rafa and all these. You know, the game is evolving. Big picture, where do you see it? Um, more than anything, I, I hope that – in my head, I, I had it that Roger wanted to win Wimbledon this year. He had two match points to win it last year, and he wanted to win the Olympics because it's two out of three sets on hard courts in Tokyo. I think he – he liked his chances. He'd won dubs in 2008 with Wawrinka. You know, he wanted to win Olympic gold. Uh, Djokovic wanted to win Olympic gold, especially because he's so proud to be Serbian. That would have meant the world to him. Uh, you know, the, all those guys, the fact that the Olympics is now a year away from where it was, I think greatly affects, to me, uh, that single event has been affected more than anybody. You read stories, especially about other... Olympic athletes, uh, women who put off having a baby so that yeah. they could compete in Tokyo. And yeah. now what are they going to do? Now yeah. it's a year away. So yeah, the aging athletes, I'm, I'm worried about, I'm worried about them. Uh, I think Roger, I mean, by next year, he'll be a month away from 40 when he tries to win Olympic gold. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> Serena's in the same boat, yep, you know, yep, yep. she'll be 39 in September. He'll be 39 in August. I mean, it's, uh, so uh, do I still think they'll be relevant? Of course, as long as they want to be relevant, they are going to be relevant. That's my, that's my feeling about those guys. Yeah. Um, the younger players, I think it's kind of good for Coco Golf that she has this time off so mm -hmm. she can, she can feel like a normal, a normal teenager, uh, yeah. instead of a, a superstar with a lot of pressure on her. Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of it depends on your mentality and your mm -hmm. sensibilities in general and, and who you've got around you, what kind of people you've got around you. Mm -hmm who are telling you, be patient, stay fit, yeah. stay healthy. I think the people that, I, I think character will really show up Ooh, when this thing I is like finally that. over. Yeah, I think this is going to, I think we'll find out, uh, you know, who's continued to do all that invisible work yeah, yeah. Uh, and who who still wants it badly. And again, I, I, think, I think the sport will become much more regionalized. It has mm -hmm. to be. You can't mm -hmm. be bouncing around from, country to country, time zone to time zone, which is what how the tour can be structured now. 
-hmm. I think there'll be a very specific European season, a very specific North American season, an Asian season. Mm -hmm. Not to do that is just dumb. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's my, I, I actually do see blue skies. Out yeah, there. it's, it's going to happen, gonna, yeah. It's, but Luke, it's going to have to take a lot of clarity of thought. Mm -hmm. It's got to take a lot of good decision making. It's mm -hmm. got, and it's going to have to take a community. And that mm -hmm. to me is the, maybe the, the thing that'll come out of this more than anything. Mm -hmm. That we understand our sport, we understand what it takes to make it stronger. And we finally, finally come together and do something about it. Well, Mary, I'm telling you, thank you so much for your time. You are Anytime, so Luke. deeply respected. Every time I see you, you make everybody smile. There's an energy and a passion, a true calling for this sport and to tell the story. And I thank you so much again for joining us on Luke's Legends. Luke, I say, Luke, I say the same words to you. Great to talk to you, my friend. Thanks, Mary. And that's it, everybody. Presented by World Team Tennis. Catch us on Facebook, Instagram, and of course, WTT.com. See you next time. <laughs>